this slide right here is just a few quick facts of kind of what we were dealing with. This storm rolled in last year right after Christmas, came on that Saturday, and basically it was pretty much blizzard conditions from Saturday evening all the way through Sunday morning, early morning. And um, the thing about this storm that we're not really used to is that we had sustained winds 30 to 40, I think 18 hours straight. It was, it was crazy. And that caused what we drifts up to from six foot to 10 foot tall. Most of our roads stayed pretty clean. Um, north south roads, what really killed us was our east west roads. And so, just to kind of give you an idea of what we were dealing with. So, you can see from the map, this is the total snowfall from uh, Winter Storm Goliath. And you can see Lubbock took the big brunt of it. Um, our main snow issues that we have are kind of in the southwest part of our district. But I know Lubbock got hammered on this one. Just to kind of give you an idea of what we're dealing with, um, this is just a farm market road in Randall County. You can see that one of the big issues is these storms aren't really plow storms. Um, they're more heavy equipment and bee box type storms. And so it, it took us a while to get through all this stuff. Um, another one, one thing that did help us out is the temperatures were so cold and the wind chill factor was from zero to 10 degrees. And basically, that snow didn't stick to the road, so we were able to clear it off. And when we got down to it, then it dried out pretty quick, and traffic was pretty well able to resume. Um, the other thing we dealt with quite a bit was stranded vehicles, and that, that's a big issue um, if you know about it, because we spend a lot of time and resources trying to rescue the public. And when you're in the middle of a storm, then you're directing resources to these stranded vehicles, and you're starting to lose other types of roads. So another picture of that, you can kind of see it. this was our operation for most of the storm was just basically loaders, trucks and blades and snow blowers and this is one of my favorite slides because it always helps when you have big snow just to have a little help from your neighbor so uh, that's all for me. All right, I'm going to go over the same thing that Blair went over, same storm, winter storm Goliath, but mine's more sort of isolated to the I-10-20 split. Uh, here's a map showing sort of where the I-10-20 split is. It's sort of out in the middle of nowhere. It's not really good access from any office. Uh, our closest office, Bellmeray, is 24 miles away, and it's probably the sm it's our smallest office in the district. Uh, Pake is 40 miles, and Van Horn's another 46 miles away. Uh, here's a couple of pictures that were taken. I show viewers submitted that was actually not a good thing that was came through our complaint system talking about how little we were doing and how bad it was out there. Uh, this is some, some of the negatives. There were sort of lessons learned. Uh, the forecast, as Blair showed, a lot of it was shown to be up to the north. We got a lot of snow out here and it's sort of concentrated in this 10-20 split. There's sort of a terrain feature there that causes us to get bad weather there. It was really snow packed and we had reports of up to four inches of ice. So we had a lot of ice, not a lot of snow and the ice did stick to the road. Uh, we were getting reports. I went to bed that night that all this happened probably about 12 o'clock. My maintenance supervisor said traffic is moving. They're moving five, 10 miles an hour. And I wake up at four o'clock in the morning from a call from uh, Gilbert Jordan asking me what's going on. We're getting reports of people stranded for 10 hours. So there was a lot of communications issues and I think one of the problems was there was actually an accident somewhere between Van Horn and the split that blocked up the road that they got it cleared. Well, then it got to our district and we had a bridge construction going on down to one lane. So then that stopped it again. Uh, we really didn't have any firsthand reports from within Textile, so communication was a big issue out here on this one. Uh, and we didn't have enough resources sent out here. I had some additional plows came in from Waco and Brownwood, but I had them stationed up in the northern part of our district where we're supposed to get hit with more snow. Uh, and the other picture was BPS actually trying to figure out what was going on because nobody could get there. My guys couldn't get there from Odessa. El Paso couldn't get there from Van Horn. They actually sent a helicopter out there. And you can see in the picture, one of the issues we had was 
The 18 wheelers got to the point they felt it wasn't safe to drive, so they just stopped in the middle of the road and refused to, to move, even when we asked them to. So some of them got moved by Sheriff's Department. Uh, positive that's this. Uh, we did take resources. Uh, El Paso sent some crews from Alpine. I got some of the plows that came in from Brownwood and Waco and had them head out there. We did finally get it opened up. Of course, the sun came out and everything cleared up. You can see the mountains. Uh, I think it led to better communications with all of our partners, with the DDC, DPS, and between El Paso and Odessa. Uh, we did have a follow-up meeting after this one. And from this, future plans is that we're actually going to put in a reef station out there that will have equipment bays, uh, mechanics shops, and storage centers. Uh, we're renting a trailer that will be manned out there from November through the end of February. So hopefully we'll we'll be able to get the resources out there for it. Hey, that's me. All right. All right. Uh, hey, Mark Schaefer, uh, Air Engineer in Brenham. Um, May 26, 2016, it started to rain in Washington County. Um, and it rained and rained and rained. And the, the best way I heard it put was in May of 2015, the county Was Washington County set a record for a one month total of rainfall. So recorded history, May 2015, most rainfall ever. May 26, we beat that record. Um, we had roads flooding that had never seen water before. Um, we were totally caught unprepared for something of that magnitude. Um, we sent folks out to the normal spots where it normally floods to put out our barricades and ended up getting them trapped because the creek behind them would flood. And so they were trapped on high ground for hours and hours. Um, after a while, we ran out of barricades. Um, so we didn't have, we didn't have manpower. We didn't have materials. Uh, it was a bad night. Um, one of the first places in, in Brenham at Higgins Creek on, uh, business 36, uh, the city had installed this nice feature, these walls, uh, the water didn't like them, uh, Ate out behind the walls, collapsed the walls, collapsed our road. Uh, we had to ask the city to come in and, and close that road down for us because we were out of barricades and didn't have people to send over there. Um, that was a Thursday. On Saturday morning, I came into work and got a phone call from dispatch saying that someone had called in, uh, that there was this little dip on Wolf Creek Bridge on State Highway 36 and asked if we could go take a look at it. And if you, you see the little spot in the middle, that was, that's a little pond of water in the middle of the bridge. And so I got there and that's what I found underneath the bridge. Uh, all the debris had washed up underneath. There's actually two bridge structures. It had washed underneath the first bridge structure, hit the second bridge structure and started snapping columns. And so, uh, quick phone call to the sheriff and had a couple units out there blocking off the bridge and we were it took a little while but and a little help but we had, had that bridge shut down we have traffic on on the one bridge for now um, the city of clay uh, it's right there at the border of Burleson County and Washington County uh, we had actually two locations in the in the county that were they were just cut off from civilization uh, on the north side of Clay, uh, we had a creek come out for a day. And then on the south side, we had the Yawa Creek come out for a couple days. And so coordination with Sheriff's Office, with DPS to try and get these people some supplies until we could get the roads back open. Actually on the, uh, on the north side of Clay, uh, close to that, we had a culvert washout also that we had to go in and fix. Um, FM 50, a little bit further south uh, from the Yawa Creek. This is Jackson Creek. Uh, you can see the, the support in the center of the bridge. Took off a column. The water was just so strong, it, it pulled, pulled the rebar out of the bent. 
And then State Highway 105 at Rocky Creek, a spot that had never flooded before. Uh, water went over the bridge. Uh, if you look at the, the, the top side of that picture, uh, those are gabion baskets that are 10 by 25 foot long that have been washed out from underneath the bridge and put into that farmer's field. Um, here's some close-up shots of uh, some of the erosion that happened from, from that event. So that's what we dealt with for our flood. So we got here some pictures and we'll start, I'll give a brief background. So we had uh, the tax day flood of 2016, uh, which the extra mile award went to today for Bryan District, they talked about that. So, um, and the Memorial Day followed that. During the tax day flood, we had 240 billion gallons of water hit the Houston region. All that came from like the west side of town, Waller, and it just moved its way all the way down to the coast. So Waller County had 14.5 inches of rain over that like two day period. And so um, most of that's uh, prairie land, so it's flat. Uh, Grand Parkway goes right through there, comes through all that water, just sheet flowed all the way across uh, into Attics Reservoir. And if you're not familiar with Houston, there's two reservoirs, Attics and Barker. They're uh, federal uh, Corps of Engineer reservoirs and their sole purpose is to keep Houston from flooding. So they shut the gates and they have um, the capacity is 103 in attic, so there was 102.63. It was a record. Uh, they were out of federal land. Uh, neighborhoods are built, so they will flood as far upstream as needed uh, to protect city of Houston. That's their only mission. And so they have to get a reading downstream at Memorial Park in Buffalo Bayou uh, at a certain reading before they can open the gates. And it's usually about 2,000 CFF. During the storm, before they close the gates, it was reading, you know, they, it was getting up to like 4,000. 5,000 CFS are there, and so they had to shut the gates. And so that kind of sets up the picture here. Uh, this is State Highway 6. This is the center barrier on Highway 6 looking from I-10. It was under water for two weeks. This was the fifth time since it was built in 19, uh, actually the third time since like 1936 when it was built that it's gone under water. And so this was the longest duration, uh, two weeks. And so we had Tom out and he uh, brought the radar machine out and we checked the pavement, it's all asphalt. For, uh, being underwater that that long and uh, to date we've had no no major issues a couple minor uh, cracking and stuff but the pavement's held up pretty well this is an aerial shot of the uh, area this is a a little creek runs through here but again here's i-10 up here and then this is all highway 6 uh, that was underwater this is uh, state highway 99 the grand parkway and fm 529 you can see this is the west side all the water uh, actually, this is the west side. This is going into Houston. And you can see we had troopers out there and uh, vehicles were still passing it. The trooper finally stopped someone. He said, why are you here? The road's closed. He said, well, I could fit through the cones and barrels so the road's open. He's like, no, it's not. Turn around. Uh, but, you know, one trooper can only do so much. And that's a struggle we had. Uh, people that just continue to drive into high water. This is another aerial of, two, of uh, 99. So you see a lot of dry pavement here, and, uh, but no cars. They couldn't get to it. Up here, upstream, downstream, it was underwater. And so for the most part, State Highway 99 was the driest uh, area out there. But uh, in some cases, you just couldn't, couldn't get to it. I'll let Mark talk about this. Yeah, this this is, is the Memorial Day. This is um, US 90A. And the picture on the left is just I'm sitting on the uh, eastbound lanes. So the lanes are set a little bit different elevation by about a foot. And the water backs across those lanes. It's a two-way pair. Uh, and so uh, when the water came up across it, the consideration was to either close it or uh, set up the uh, two-way traffic, which we did. Uh, to do that, it's a, it's a fairly high traffic roadway. So we had a partnership with the, uh, between the maintenance section, uh, the county sheriff's office, uh, the DPS, and uh, also the, uh, we have a contractor who provides traffic control for the district. So this was like this for about a week. 
So uh, the Brazos River is about a half a mile from this point and it backed out. Uh, in this area, the Brazos River set a rec flood record. We've been keeping records on the Brazos River for a long time. It set a record that was four feet past the previous record. Uh, this is the uh, Richmond Rosenberg area where it goes through and uh, it started backing out. Uh, that's about five miles from that other location. Uh, the Brazos comes up and goes down slowly. It came up and stayed up for weeks. Some of the areas were there uh, with had elevated water elevations for uh, a couple of months. So uh, uh, we did go up. Uh, the DPS uh, came out and we flew with them to get a handle on what was going on in the region. And also the uh, TxDOT flight services came up later and took us up. Uh, to get a better picture of what was going on as well as look at some of the bridges. Uh, this is the uh, maintenance supervisor uh, went up with us, or several of the maintenance supervisors went up with us and were able to look. Uh, we were looking at debris on the river. Uh, it's hard to tell where the debris fields are and uh, we lost a lot of trees so uh, we were trying to find where we were going to have bridge issues. Uh, we did, this maintenance supervisor was fairly innovative and we tried very hard to get permission to use a drone to look at one of his bridges and came very close to it but, but uh, ended up not being able to do that. Um, this is an area along the Brazos River in Sugarland, and um, the roadway and shore weathered the storm fairly well and then two months later when the river finally went down um, it took the bank with it. We lost about 300 feet of shoreline in that area. Uh, we had 300 feet of storm drain that went out to the river and drained both frontage roads. And uh, this is a concrete pavement uh, turnaround that's fairly heavily used. Uh, and it undermined it by about six to eight feet. So uh, to get an idea of the damage, we did an emergency repair contract. and It let for $1.5 million. So some positive things is uh, don't ever be afraid to get with flight services. We got with them immediately and we had a plane at Sugarland three different days in a row. Uh, they came down, you want, you kind of think a plane, maybe you can't get that great of a view. They flew at a thousand feet. We could fit eight people in there, uh, very maneuverable. Uh, so it was a great resource. Jay Joseph set it up for us, sent the same team down every day. We showed up with a map where we wanted to go and really got to make a lot of operational decisions, flying bridges, flying debris fields. Uh, we took the area engineer, maintenance supervisor, uh, some of our other district maintenance staff, and really got a good picture of what was going on. Because this, we said, it was historic levels of what the Brazos was doing. People had never seen this type of flooding on the Brazos uh, down in the Houston region. So we flew all the way out to the Gulf to see what it was doing there, how it was going out, where we saw, and we were able to see what was happening in Waller and predict what was going to happen down in uh, Brazoria County. And so we did the same thing with DPS. Uh, as soon as the next, as soon as they could get a helicopter up, they were waiting for us. We have a great relationship with Region Two, at our uh, traffic management center. There's a heliport right there. They met us there. They took us up uh, as many times as we wanted. We took uh, uh, Commissioner Mosley up. He did an aerial tour. Uh, some of the county judges did the same thing to really get that operational awareness of what's going on. You can only, you know, we pull up to a bridge. We can't get out. We really were looking into drones, and hopefully Textile will, will get there. Um, to do some of that immediate reconnaissance type stuff that a drone uh, can do on there. Um, working with the locals was a major plus, and I know everyone does their best, but really being embedded with your locals, with TDM. Uh, in Houston, we're fortunate enough to have Houston Transtar. That's where our EOC is located, so we were there for all the county briefings. TDM was there, the mayor, the judge. Uh, Quincy was able to give briefings, situational awareness. Uh, we worked 24-hour shifts there. Um, one thing we still struggle, I think everyone does, is me and Mark want to be there the whole time, and you really got to go and take that time to sleep, go home, uh, pass the torch on to the next person. So for us, we're really working better to, to split our time. Um, but just by nature, you're in the, in the heat of the uh, disaster, and you want to stay up to date of what's going on um, with it. Some uh, things we could do better is... Uh, the county doesn't have the same system that we have at Drive Texas or Houston Transtar, 
but we got all the calls. We had over 475 calls in a four hour period to our district office wanting to know road status. Um, Harris County, the, the main player, didn't have any system to show those closures besides calling the local precinct or the sheriff's office. And so a lot of people, when you tell them that, they don't want to call the non-emergency line and wait. So we were on a rapid deployment with some of the precincts that were most affected. Houston Transtar and TTI, with our resources, we immediately set up a website to show those closures and we had the county inputting that data so citizens could go out there and see county roads. Because we said like the reservoir, Highway 6 was closed for two weeks, but there was five or six other roads across the reservoir that were closed the same. And so um, that included modifying signals, working on detours, getting that message out. And again, majority of those roads weren't us, but we were getting all the calls and all the inquiries. Um, Mark could talk some about the signals, what we did. Yeah, we oh, did. We uh, for the closures for State Highway 6, uh, it's a major commuter route into Houston. And uh, so our uh, traffic operations group went in and retimed the signals on those corridors. You know, it's not a short event. Uh, when it was underwater for uh, a week plus, uh, we had to retime those signals so that uh, it favored the movements that were headed in and out of Houston. So uh, we had to be able to, to work with the, the county and get that uh, accomplished so that we weren't overwhelmed with traffic. We are fortunate to be able to do that remotely. And so what we did is Highway 6 was priority. They moved all the cross streets and other thoroughfares to priority. But on the back end, we, in a short amount of time, the water went down and we wanted to get the road open by rush hour and coordinating that so the signal guys could get that Highway 6 back into priority so we wouldn't have all this traffic stacked up and Highway 6 would be empty, but all the cross streets would be uh, moving. So that's a, a thing too, just internal coordination. That's something that's easily, when you're in a rush to get it open, you can figure about that. Um, one thing that came out of this is all a lot of citizens wanted to know what's gonna flood, when's it gonna flood? So knowing locations that have that potential to flood. And so we brought TTI on board and we've done it. We're in the in ending part of a big research project uh, on what areas are prone to flood and looking at floodgates, flood gauges, um, deployment, staging of equipment. Everyone, the city of Houston stages barrels and cones and traffic control devices. We do that some, but now it's becoming a point where they're expecting that. They want a list of what areas may go underwater, what areas do you have resources, where are you staging people? And so we worked on that, looking at our pump stations, depressed sections, working with area engineers, maintenance supervisors, and knowing what areas are prone to flood uh, and really keeping an eye on those working between either TxDOT or contract resources. Uh, one area we had uh, a fatality on Memorial Day 15 and then three fatalities on tax day. And so in that area, we actually put up uh, floodgates. That's what we call them. It's actually a farm gate that can be closed. It's locked in place open during the you know non-flooding conditions. But when it floods, we can go in there and close those gates and it ties into Harris County Toll Road and they did the same thing, but we're looking at automated systems, railroad type crossings that would come down uh, that are being monitored out of our ITS center. So just being aware of that whole situation of areas that may flood, that have flooded. Uh, these areas in Houston haven't probably flooded since Allison, which was you know going on 15, 20 years ago. Um, 15 years, not 20, but so people forget, people move in. Uh, again, just a struggle of that education, uh, social media, Everyone, like that picture we showed here at Richmond, the railroad bridge actually had a column that was sinking, but everyone was reporting that the bridges on US 90 and Richmond were closed. Um, and every, you know, we're getting those calls, are you closed? Are you closing the bridge at five o'clock? You close, you know, these rumors get out there and they're really hard to manage. Uh, and Mark can talk some about one in Brazoria County. Yeah, we had had a project a few years ago uh, where we rebuilt um, and added on a uh, set of lanes for divided highway at one point in the project there was a consideration for elevating the roadway to avoid the potential for flooding and they were not able to do that because they couldn't mitigate the effects of blocking water when they raised that roadway um, someone out in the public remembered that conversation and started a very interesting set of posts on uh, facebook and twitter and you you know, you name it, it was out there. And TxDOT had caused all the flooding. And we had blocked the, the floodway. And so, um, you know, our PIO, uh, our PIOs 
are very active on social media, so they were trying to help that. Uh, the county did go out and uh, assist with that. At one point, the, one of the main posters had a county sheriff's uh, vehicle show up at his house and they threatened to arrest him if he didn't stop posting false information. I mean, it was really panicky stuff down there and it was getting very ugly. And uh, so they were able to get a handle on it eventually. But uh, it was, social media changes things very quickly. So uh, you can't underestimate the effects of, of reports for a snow event or uh, for flooding. On the other side with the aerial photos and photos during the operation, we were really able to tell a song, strong story of what Textile was doing and what resources we had out there. Our PIOs, we have uh, four PIOs in Houston, so we were able to deploy them into the field and actually ride along with the workers, fly with us, get these photos, send stuff out real time and let people know what was going on, areas that they may not be able to get into. Some of the pictures in the aerial, they could see their homes, their road, and it was really able to let people know what we're doing, how we're doing it, where we're doing it, and the great press on that side, just being very open and uh, forefront on what's going on through social media that helped a great. The last thing is just partnering with our neighboring districts. Uh, Brian Beaumont, Beaumont brought us a whole semi load full of traffic control devices. We staged them in area office that wasn't affected. They were able to distribute those out. We did some emergency purchase orders to buy type three barricades um, locally instead of going through RDC because we would have cleaned them out. So we uh, got permission from Daryl to buy them locally. We bought them all staged in the same way. And we had a lot of issues uh, issuing to counties to other sections. And it worked great given a section that wasn't affected to deploy those resources, deliver them. Um, and so that was also like FOD, huge help, staging equipment. Uh, our Houston office, we always just, if something's coming, they take care of us, they rent equipment, they rent trailers, whatever we need and get that pre-deployed, you know, days in advance. So when the storm hits, we're not scrambling, trying to get stuff moved around. And uh, just that pre-planning really makes a huge difference in, uh, in what you're doing. I know some of the rental, we may, we're at a slight advantage because there's a lot of rental equipment in Houston, but taking that time to really know what you need and get it out there early, uh, we're on board. Even if it doesn't move, we'd rather have it than try to wait till the day of and try to get a load or get some type of equipment out there. So it makes a big difference having all those players at the table. So FOD, PIO, um, we're all together during the EOC. We have a you know fully staffed uh, HR uh, administration. We're there and uh, making those decisions immediately, so we're not able to to stumble out there when we need something in the field. Let me go through um, your district management structure. So we'll kind of take it back over here to Chad, and we'll kind of go back down. But kind of describing the roles and responsibility during an emergency event. I mean, really during an emergency event, each one of them is a little bit different, but. Typically, our, everybody out in the field is our maintenance supervisor, be the, the hands-on. Uh, a lot of our sections don't have an assistant, so when they're doing shift work, it'll go to a crew chief or we'll determine who will be the best person for each section. Uh, coming up, it'll be coming through maintenance engineer to me, director of ops, and the DE. Okay. about you, Mark? Uh, for this event, I was actually the interim maintenance supervisor for Washington County at the same time. Uh, so I had two hats. So I ended up having to give really all my area engineer duties over to my assistant, let her handle all the construction so I could spend my time over in the maintenance section. Uh, not being, you know, really with a strong maintenance background, I really had to rely on my maintenance supervisor, uh, my assistant maintenance supervisor uh, for the day-to-day -day assigning of crews, uh, what sort of equipment we needed, uh, what sort of materials we needed, and uh, my role was really to prioritize what needed to be done to assess the damages and to uh, act as the go-between between what we needed in the field and what our director of maintenance could provide us. Uh, Terry Bahalik, our maintenance of uh, our director of maintenance. Uh, for this, uh, if you've ever watched Shawshank Redemption, uh, Morgan Freeman's character, uh, Red, he was the guy that you went to to get stuff. Well, that, that was Terry. I could call him and say, hey, I need this piece of equipment, I need this material, I need manpower, and he would provide it. He, he'd uh, either go outside the district, uh, ask for help, or he would get other maintenance supervisors to, to send people materials, equipment to us. Uh, so that's kind of how we handle it. How about Blair? Uh, for this one, they activated the DDC, and what that did is 
we put the director of operations at the DDC, and he was basically the contact from the DDC to the district EOC. And so we had our maintenance administrator running our EOC, and then from there we had our AEs coordinating resources within their areas, maintenance supervisors. They're responsible for everything basically in their in their county, and then of course we had our PIO, which is keeping our media relations intact, and then uh, fleet and warehouse, making sure that we had all the equipment and supplies we needed. So that was how we set up on this particular storm. Okay, Mark. Um, we're in Houston. It's a very political environment. Um, you know, we have everyone from uh, the mayor to the county judge to transportation commission members are all local. And so uh, our DE and deputy DE were uh, worked very hard and uh, were able to deal with some of the political questions and issues. And uh, so that was that was a very important part of the of our operation. Um, uh, Walter and I pretty well tag team like we're doing this presentation, I guess, and uh, work together to uh, deal with the uh, emergency response. Um, the area engineer and area engineers and the maintenance supervisors uh, are the, the hands-on first line and so they go out and uh, I look at my job as trying to help them do what they need to do so uh, if I can't help them I'm not going to get anything done so um, uh, we have a fairly large special jobs unit and uh, FOD fleet unit and so they were both very uh, very good and very flexible at helping and uh, moving things around, filling in for sections. Uh, some of these events uh, or some of the activities lasted for weeks. So when you go on a 24-7 operation, uh, you start running out of people very quickly. So we were able to backfill and uh, move sections around and uh, help with that. So, do you have anything to add? I think we we bring in a lot of support staff uh, from purchasing or FOD people that can run the EOC. So myself, Mark, and we really get a lot of success of getting Quincy out in the field. Uh, as soon as we can leave the EOC, we get him out there on the road, see people working, interacting, and it makes a really big difference with the crews when the DE shows up and he's standing right there beside him. And uh, so that's been a real success of of getting that support staff that can run the EOC, so we're not there 24/7. Now, you know, everybody's faced with a challenge and everything. So one of the things is, I mean, three things that went right and three things that need some improvement. So Chad, we'll start with you. Uh, three things went right, I think, is we sort of helped establish through the after, after event meetings is a better structure through our DDC and our contacts between the districts and the DPS and TDM, the DDCs. Uh, I think once we realized what the issue was, I think we did get a good job of allocate resources whether it was from FOD or our district or the El Paso district and coordinating to get a response out there. Mark? Um, things that went well. We, we already had some very good relationships with our local contractors and the guys that lived in the community. Uh, they were very helpful in helping us get through all of this. Uh, they handled you know, a lot of things that we couldn't handle in-house. Uh, they were very easy to negotiate with because they knew where we were coming from and they knew how important it was to get people, you know, back home and back to their businesses and, and about their lives. At one point we had 16 roads closed. Uh, so we, you know, the county was really shut down until we could get back in there and work. And so being able to work with our contractors to get them uh, out and mobilized as quickly as we could, that was a very big positive. Uh, some of the internal communications that Terry and I had throughout the whole thing. Uh, we had, you know, multiple calls in a day to, to update each other, uh, to let him know what my needs were, to let me know what was available. Uh, just that communication went really well. Um, and the third thing I was, uh, that went well was I was really proud of our guys with our safety culture. We worked a lot of overtime. We ended up working like 19 days in a row. Uh, not one injury, not one accident. I was very proud of my guys. Um, three things that went well were, of course, <coughs> our relationship with our contractors, our counties, the 
Texas Forest Service or neighbors. Um, when you get a big event like that, everybody pitches in, and you know, especially since we were low on heavy equipment, um, we were able to get contractors and anybody that had heavy equipment to come help us out. Um, I think another thing that went well was that we had a decision maker in the DDC. I think that helped with having quick decisions made at the DDC and then put it back into the EOC so it could get to the field guys. Um, we were able to close roads in a quick manner because sometimes if you let those roads just stay open for a while and you're trying to make a decision back and forth, um, you could have a real problem with stranded vehicles if you let it go too long. So I thought we had timely decisions out of the DDC. Um, Another thing that I thought went well is we had a lot of pre-planning meetings uh, prior to the storm. We knew it was coming, um, so we had plenty of advanced coordination uh, with the, but actually the adjacent states, the DPS, the districts, and so I thought that was pretty good. Uh, as far as three things that didn't go well, I thought you find out in those type of storms that you do not have enough heavy equipment when you only have two loaders in the county or one loader in the county. Um, it takes a long time to drive up to. Uh, Get your, dig your way out of this, but I think hindsight's 2020. When you need to look at that, if you see this type of storm coming on, you might want to look at renting some equipment, staging it prior to the storm. Um, another thing that really helped us out, but did was our snow blowers. Um, but they are 20 years old, so uh, they dug us out a lot of things. But we did have to work on them long. And then the other thing that I thought was really tough on us it was becoming an emergency responder and actually responding to these. Uh, to every stranded vehicle. And basically, we were fielding calls from the sheriff's office, and, and that, that had us get behind the storm. Um, of course, that's, I think that's our job duty, but it just on the back end, it takes you a lot longer to dig out. So um, that's my answers. Okay, Mark. Uh, one of the things that worked very well for us was our partnerships with our uh, sister agencies. Uh, the One of the underpasses that flooded, and we had several fatalities in, um, it's, you know, it, it's an underpass under 610, but uh, it involves, Hectra has an entering roadway, Harris County Toll Road Authority, there's city streets that enter that. Um, it's not just TxDOT, so uh, we were, worked very well with the uh, uh, sister organizations. Um, we were helped by our neighboring districts, uh, appreciated y'all sending uh, signs and equipment in. And uh, you find out how many road close signs you have in the district fairly quickly, and it's not enough. Um, so we had several hundred come into the district between the neighboring district and a purchase, and I don't think we still had, had enough. Uh, we worked very well with uh, DPS and flight services, like we talked about, to get an overall global sense of what was going on as well. A few things went bad. It's like uh, traffic control. We don't do a tremendous amount of in-house work, so we didn't have a lot of devices like we mentioned. And also like aggregate sand and stuff that the prison and other organizations are wanting for sandbags. We don't keep a tremendous amount of bulk material on hand. So uh, we've looked at that for some of our more rural sections to have surplus of that during flooding season or something that so we have it available. Let me add one thing that didn't work well for us. Yes, sir. We ended up closing a number of locations, uh, you know, bridge approaches that were washed out. Uh, we set our barricades across, and then we find out later on that a sheriff's deputy would go back and look and see, well, the water's off the road, and uh, everything looks okay. I'm going to pull these barricades off. And we pull them off to the side and allow traffic to go back and forth. Uh, it, and it was after the fact when we finally had our after-action meeting where I could tell them, you know, you, just because we close a road doesn't mean it's just because there's water over it. Uh, at one location on FM 912, we had an officer pull the barricades and we got on the phone and, and called and said, have your officer go back and look underneath the road. And it was the approach slab, was a, it was attached to the bridge and it was attached, you know, 20 feet away and there was nothing else underneath it. And he had no idea from looking at it from the top. And so, uh, Part of the after action report that we, you know, we talked about was educating their deputies, uh, educating local law enforcement that just because we close a road for flooding and the water's off doesn't mean that it's safe. Thanks, Mark. Guys, I know we ran to our limit, but really quick, any questions for the panel? Yeah. 
if uh, we had any divers go down on the Brazos River to check the condition? We had uh, some divers go down. Um, one of the things that we had was we brought in a uh, crew from the bridge division to go out and evaluate the bridges that had been uh, or were in the middle of having uh, flooding issues. So uh, some of it we did did do that. It was kind of a triage from which ones were uh, more critical from Scour. And so we did do some of that. They immediately pulled all the reports, developed us a Scour critical list based on last uh, BRINSAP, and then they brought the electronic equipment and did uh, surveys right there on the site. Uh, St. Jacinto River, we did have to use some divers. When we identified known locations that weren't right, we had dive teams come in. Bernie, with the inspection, Brett, you want to add to anything? Yeah, so I can answer that a little bit. Uh, we didn't want to put divers in the water immediately because you don't want, there's too much debris, not, and the water velocity is too high. So we don't want to put divers in immediately. What we do is we have an acoustic, uh, it's a little, it's a little machine, it shoots an acoustic sound down, it, it measures the water depth. But what we can do is we can compare that to the last inspection and see if the, the channel's been cut down anymore. Uh, we also have a, uh, a firm on contract that has 2D and 3D acoustic imaging for it. If, we're, if we do uh, suspect something really bad has happened, like we did on the Sabine River in the Beaumont District this past spring, we authorized them to go out there and they did acoustic imaging of, of all the, the vents along that along those bridges. So we don't want to put divers in the water because of the debris and the velocity, but we have the ability to, to assess it in other ways. Uh, I know there was one more. Yeah, I don't know if it's feasible or not. Uh, one of the things I know people don't like to call the end of the non-register number to find out about the floating system. Is there anything talks or anything about maybe developing an app that takes out apps that they can download and download and find out like actual closures? I know we have at least a chance start, but maybe some other things that they can do. Yeah, I don't know if it's feasible or not. Uh, one of the things I know people don't like to call the end of the non-register number to find out about floating system. I know we have at least a chance start, but maybe some other things that they can do. Yeah, I don't know if it's feasible or not. Right. So, so drivetexas.org is a, it's a mobile site that works just like an app. And so we were 100% on that. It's the local roads that the county and the city typically don't have a system to input that data um, on there. It's like Houston Transstar is developing, developing an app and it has the ability to do local streets, but there's not a commitment for resources from the county or the city to to maintain that and TxDOT doesn't have the resources to do that but the it is feasible and available if the resources were out there.